And you got to be really good here. Right. Okay, That's, this is the right side. You're looking at the anterior aspect. This is the right side. And this is the atrium. And then blood travels down through a valve. This is our first valve that we've got to be good with. And listen, you've got to know these valves. It's going to come up. This one right here is known as the tricuspid. And if you look at its picture on that page in your book, you literally see three valves. That's why it's called the tricuspid valve, right? And then blood goes down here, and here's another right. This is called, anybody want to give me a ventricle? ventricle. Blood leaves that. Now, I cannot give you a lot of rationale on this one, but it's pretty consistent to the other side, so it's good. This is now going into a semi-lunar valve. And I can only imagine it's because it, it's named that way because of a crescent shape that it would have at the heart. And so they would name it that, and then they would also name it for what it's going into now, here's the tricky part, and I get it because I was really always really struggled with this. It's going into a valve that will take it to the lungs in a pathway that is going away from the heart. So this right here is the pulmonary semilunar valve, and this is the pulmonary artery. Oh, uh, artery, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, artery. Artery. Yes. Yes. Sorry, artery. He was right. So this is the pulmonary artery. See, I gotta be careful when I listen to the card. <laughs> so this is the pulmonary semilunar valve. This is the pulmonary artery. And then it's gonna hit the lungs. It will receive oxygenation there, and then it's going to travel back around in the pulmonary vein. Right? So you got a vein, and you got a vein. Coming in, now you're at the left atrium. It drops down here into a valve known as the bicuspid, a.k.a. mitral. Now, I don't know where they get mitral, but I do know that bicuspid, because if you look at that picture, it shows you two valves. Yes, sir? Mitral comes from the whole tap. It's shaped like a fish. It's, it's two pieces that come up and go there. Yep. It's called the mitre. There you go. That makes hope. I actually think I've heard that before. And I almost want to say I've heard you say that before. I think I did. I think you said that a year ago in physical disability. <laughs> Ooh, but an I didn't M. Get, I didn't stick with you, man. I'm sorry. I knew you had it. That's all right. That's it. And we're getting there. Okay. That's, 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 the, that's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember it's not Michael Jordan. <laughs> Whatever you got to do. I just don't come into my kid's room and say that because he's got a big poster of Michael well, Jordan. I don't want to know anybody that wears 32. Uh, OJ Simpson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I do. So dropping through there, landing at the left ventricle. Now, I do want to pause here. This is like your money maker right here. Lots of stuff going to be happening around that left ventricle because it's the one that pumps into the aortic semilunar valve. So again, it's another semilunar. So you got two semilunars down here and into the aorta, which takes it around through circulation or dumps it into circulation. So we're going to get back into that aorta here in a minute. But that's kind of your, your sole focus is just saying, okay, I got it. So let me go back to that question. 
if they have mitral regurgitation. So, like, maybe you don't know what that is. Right? I mean, like, you're like, I don't know what mitral regurgitation is. So, let me ask you this. First of all, you know what the mitral valve is. Have you ever heard the word regurgitation? Yeah. Kind of like stuff comes back up. Oh, it's regurgitating, right? I mean, I don't know if you're you're aware that's kind of what cattle do. In one of their, how many stomachs do they have? Four. Yeah, that's four. Okay. They regurgitate their food, and they chew it, and then it goes back down. I guess it's like, it's just a process. Glad I don't have to do it. That's called regurgitation. So micro regurgitation means blood is kind of pooling here. That's also something that's very common with a condition um, known as atrial fibrillation. They'll get atrial regurgitation at both levels, which then could be responsible for something called stroke. And we'll make that connection later. So right there is your pathways. They're going to ask it more in that kind of question. Got it? It's, it's, it's rare. I, I mean, almost unthinkable that they would just land you at a space and say, where is the blood going to next? Or where did it come from? That's, that's just not a very PTA kind of question. But they might. I mean, I, I can't say they won't. I don't know what they're going to allow and disallow. Fingers crossed. Yeah. So 357, let's look at 211. 357 shows another picture of the heart. That shows you some coronary circulation. Now, we got to be really clear. Coronary, that word, do you, do you get that word? That word is circulation around the heart. It's, it's speaking about the arteries and the veins that supply the heart muscle itself. Right, because we know it's a muscle. Um, in fact, I've been telling Adam now for a long time. I got a big old cow uh, heart that I'm going to bring him because I think he should eat it. Mm -hmm. It's Why literally the size of your head, everybody in here. Why do you have a cow heart? Enormous. Well, when I had my last deer butchered, I told him I wanted to keep the heart. Like a cow heart? It's a steer heart, but that steer weighs 1,300 pounds. So, it's, it's the size of your head. To keep the liver. Huh? To keep the liver. Yeah. Sounds like fear Was that the bait the heart? I've never had, I've never consumed cow heart. I've consumed a lot of deer heart. It's, it's about this size, though. Is it chewy? It's very good. Um, you got to get the pericardium off. And then, okay, so you got this thing, and now look at it. Look at the model, and if, if this is really a hang-up, just grab this model later. The heart gets its own blood supply. And when that heart supply is blocked, that's when you have a coronary blockage, which leads to angina, which leads to heart attack, right? So that's that. we'll get into that in a little bit. Another thing is it talks about the conduction system. So there's one really big area on the conduction system that I want to pin you down on, and that's the SA node, the sinoatrial node. That is your heart's pacemaker, right? So you're going to see that. And then you've got innervation of the heart, um, and it breaks it down for you. And this might help a lot connect some dots. And I didn't do this in physical disabilities, and I don't think, I don't know, Jerry may have done this, but sympathetic influence, what does that mean? That means like when you need to be alert or like fight or flight, that's sympathetic. So it's achieved by the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it stimulates the chambers of the heart to beat faster and with greater force. But parasympathetically, what you're all doing now, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're a little sympathetic after that quiz, it's achieved with acetylcholine. So I would kind of keep in mind that norepinephrine and epinephrine, they linger up there in the sympathetic, but acetylcholine 
and the vagus nerve, they keep us all calm, right? So if you, if, if you remember, what was the vagus nerve? It's a cranial nerve, and it's connected into the medulla, and it has a region that goes down to the heart and helps to keep a connection there. And then you turn the page. You got some neural reflexes. I, I really don't think you uh, would struggle with a lot of this. Um, you know, baroreceptor, um, that is a pressure receptor. And so that is in the heart, but also in the arteries. Uh, and it understands pressures. And so what we're speaking here is specifically a blood pressure. The vein bridge reflex, that has a unique aspect and probably a new term, um, but it's spent with the vagal signals, and so it is parasympathetic until it's not. And then take a look, you've got chemoreceptor reflex, and that looks specifically at the pH status and blood oxygen tension. And then, oh my my, we already cracked the shell. Valsalva maneuver. I'll let you kind of read through that paragraph, but I bet you know exactly what it says. And it connects it directly with something we just talked about called baroreceptors. And I want to pause right now and tell you, when you see Valsalva maneuver, your first inclination better go to blood pressure. Like, it's got to go there first. As soon as you read the question and you see something like breath holding or valsalva maneuver, you immediately lock into, I'm going to rule out blood pressure first. Period. Everything else will come, but we're going to rule that out first. And then we get into cardiac cycle. These are some really generic words, though. Arterial, arterial, ventricle, ventricle, and then it just goes systole and diastole. Now, what we know is systole, that's a contraction pressure. That means the, the heart has contracted and there's a pressure. And then diastole, that means the heart is at relaxation and there's a pressure, right? So I got a water hose, I turn on the water, water goes through the hose, there's pressure. But you know what, when I turn off the water, and there's no water in the hose, there's still a pressure. It's just less. Are you good with that? So there's still a pressure. That's systole and diastole. It just is directing that to the atrium and the ventricle. We usually assign those words to our blood pressure, our peripheral blood pressure, and that's okay. Keep them there, but just make sure you're tying them back to the heart as well. And then we go into this um, preload and afterload. Um, that's just talking about specifically um, venous filling pressure that fills the left ventricle. I really don't think that's a big word that I would worry about, but I like this next word down here and I would worry about it. And that's stroke volume. So everybody join me back up here and let's look at this left ventricle again. And let's pretend I took Sky's water bottle and I said this, everybody look at Sky's water bottle, and you can see there is a certain volume of water in that bottle, right? Okay, so I take that volume and I set it right here. That is the volume that will be here in the left ventricle. And what we see here is it ranges from 60 to 80 milliliters. It's sitting in the left ventricle. Now, there's a word that's not written in right here, and I'm going to put it here because this is where I think it best fits, and that is ejection fraction. Ejection fraction. I'm going to say it one more time. Ejection fraction. 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 Yeah, sorry. I wore this hoping that I wouldn't sound so muffled. I did it mainly because 
And I was like, you know what? I hope they don't misconstrue any of my words. So, so you can see my mouth moving. I, I, I hate this thing because if I look down, it pops up. And I gotta tell you, it really makes me mad. So I'm, 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 I'm gonna work really hard to deep segmentally contract my cervical deep segmental muscles. So that I don't. No naughty today. <laughs> Ejection fraction. This is a fraction of how much of that stroke volume is going to go out on contraction. Let me say it again. That's a fraction. That's a that's that's a percentage of how much is going to go out. It'd be like saying, okay, half. That's a fraction, right? Or three quarters. That's a fraction. And honestly, what I just did was I gave you what normal ejection fraction is, and that's normally 50 to 75 percent. Half to three quarters goes out, yes. 50 to 75 percent of the stroke volume, that's the formula for ejection. Yes, you, you're normal, and I have seen practice questions that hit on ejection fraction. They, they were looking like through a medical chart, you're, you're following along, you've seen a lot of these questions, they're reviewing the medical chart, and they see the ejection fraction is blah, blah, blah. Was it normal or was it not? Uh, or what should normal be? And, and they're, they're kind of hitting you on that 50 to 75%. So basically, if I wanted to go backwards in my math, I could look at stroke volume and say 60 to 80 milliliters sitting right here. 50 to 75% of that will go out on the ejection. The ejection meaning, bam, I just had a contraction. There has to be a level of blood maintained in that chamber so that you get the pressure. So it doesn't all go out. You say 50 to 75 milliliters or 50 to 75 50 to 75 percent. Your ejection yeah. fraction is 50 to 75 percent. Your the... stroke volume is 60 to 80. Okay. It's a lot of numbers. I'm sorry. I'm telling you, once you go to work, these will probably not be as big of an issue for you. <laughs> they really won't. But to get to work, we gotta know those numbers. Yeah, I had a question about just how much is related to blood contraction. I had no idea what it was. Okay, hang on. Sikari, give me that one more time. I just said I had a question over this on my exam. And I had Stroke no volume or ejection fraction? Ejection fraction. Okay. I thought well, it was now like we... when a bone shoots out somebody's arm. That was an ejection <laughs> fraction. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's how I read it. And I do cover it in, in disabilities. Um, but again, I know this is a lot, this class is, I think this class should probably be taught every semester <laughs> at some level through the program because it would really help. It's just, you know, I don't know how to do that yet. I'm working on it. I'm, 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 I'm scheming. Um, it is, a lot of questions are over diseases. They are. You're exactly right. And this chapter right here is cardiopulm diseases more than anything. And I like that. In fact, when we turn the page here in a minute, well, it's a few pages, like we dropped the ball among the diseases. And that's, that, I'm glad Scott pointed that out. I think you, you see that, even though they say that most of it's neuro, most of it's musculoskeletal, I think what you have to do is you have to like prioritize that to say most of it's still diseases of that stuff, right? So that's, that's what we're getting into though. All right, so. Run that and then go back up to the top and see cardiac output. If I took two liter bottles, right? So think about your Mountain Dew bottles at home and they're two liters. You guys all know what I'm saying right there, right? And I took one and I took two and I took a third but I only filled it halfway up. That would equal five liters. So you can kind of put that in your mind's eye and see it. That would be normal cardiac output, meaning that's how much blood would pass through the heart every minute. And then you take that times your pulse, and that helps you to understand that, right? So you can see what a cardiac output level would be. Now in exercise, what we will see patients do, like when me and Stephanie were racing each other in our one mile rock four test, we could have seen levels up to, probably not in our walk, but in certain exercises, we could see levels rise up to 40 40 liters per minute in, in really high level activity. 
But that would be like 20 of those two liters in one minute. So lots of blood happened, right? So this is a big deal. We run down now and we see this thing called venous return. Now I've got to tell you, I've, I know I've talked about it, I know Bill talks about it, I know Jerry talks about it, I know your anatomy teacher talked about it, I know your physiology teacher talks about it, but this is crucial. When we see veins, what we need to know is veins have a one-way valve and they take blood that's down here and on every muscle or every heart contraction, it takes this blood and then it transitions it to this chamber in the vein, right? So it's no longer here, it goes to here. And then this one that's down here, it goes to here through that, or that chamber. And so what you know is these valves are segmented through your veins and it needs a bump to get it to go to the next one. So what we do is we hope that the venous system is working well, or we use exercise to augment it. Because exercise of a muscle, like think calf muscles, they help to move that through. So now you've got this exercise called an ankle pump, right? And you're pushing down with those calf muscles, and it's causing blood to come in and blood to go out. And that's how you are antithrombolytic with that exercise. Then we move down and we look at systemic circulation. That's a big deal because we're looking at the aorta and we see the aorta, arterial circulation, carrying oxygenated blood all the way through the body and then back into the heart, which is deoxygenated. Some components. I like the neat and tidiness of this right here. Plasma, that's the liquid part of your blood. So if you donate plasma, you're donating the liquid part of your blood and that is easily reacquired through hydration. Red blood cells, and check this out, it makes up about 40% of your blood volume. They contain the hemoglobin. What was hemoglobin? That's your protein that binds oxygen into the red blood cell. Um, and also, uh, we look and see that if the blood carries less oxygen, they're going to get fatigued. They're going to get weak. That condition is known as anemia. A-N without or lower. E-M-I-A. That's blood. I broke all the rules Sunday night and we had a Super Bowl party. People came to my house. So you can judge me, but there was one guy there and he was recently diagnosed with polycythemia. So take a look at that one real quick. It's in parentheses there. When the red blood cells are too many. So think poly, that's a lot of. Cyth, C-Y-T, what that mean? Cell. Emia, red blood cell. So polycyth um, polycythemia, that's a red blood cell is too high. Um, and so when we see that, we see an increased risk of stroke or heart attack. That kind of looks like a, a testing type question to me. That's, that's just kind of the stuff I look at. Is, so the stroke volume effect, I mean, like if it increases, is it a, a higher like occurrence of stroke? Like it doesn't have anything to do with stroke? Stroke meaning the stroke CVA. Okay. So you're using the word stroke in two different contexts. Okay. Um, the stroke volume, well, let me go back to number one. If you're talking about a cerebrovascular accident, and it's also known as a stroke. Right. And then we go over here and we talk about something called the stroke volume. I think what we best could say to that is the contraction of the heart is also known as a stroke. Like um, one stroke to swim, you know, you have your, your stroke, right? And so one contraction is a stroke, and each stroke has a volume mm -hmm. of blood that comes out with it. And so we would say in that context, they're also known as heart contraction. Mm -hmm. Does that help? 
um, your blood platelets. Your thrombocytes, they assist in blood clotting. And if you have thrombocytemia, you may have a risk of thrombosis, also stroke or heart attack. So too much of a good thing, right? Single-handedly why I will probably never ever experience blood doping as bad as I want to. Man, I want to do it so bad I can't stand it. Well, it's nice to reduce the minute and take your blood out and then get back in there. Yeah, I, I take out a, a pint of blood today and in three months, you pump it back into me. And I would get all these red blood cells because I would remanufacture all of them. So I'd go back to normal, but then I would get all on my own and I would have all of this wonderful oxygen delivery system, but I might die. How <laughs> I many you know, it takes to go to the bathroom? I would probably be able to run a marathon way faster. Is that, is that EPO? Is that... EPO is another drug oh. that, that also expedites your oh, okay. red blood cell production. My dad has a condition where he produces too much blood. It's not polycythemia, but it's, it's like too much blood volume. Okay. He gives blood all the so he gives how often? Just out of curiosity. Um, the last time I checked, it seemed like it was at least once a month. Wow. Yeah. So that's double yeah. the frequency of what yeah. anyone else would do normally. Yeah, I remember it being double. It was double the normal average. Man, that's bad. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the what the condition is actually called, and I hope it's not uh, something I'm gonna have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, sure. he said he was already showing signs of that whenever he was my age, and I don't have to really. Well, good. Well, Laura, what would be the sign for that? Hypertension. Early onset hypertension. You know, you shouldn't have hypertension when you're in your 20s. Yeah. My brother, his son, his youngest son, who's a baseball player out here, he's got just abnormally high blood pressure. When I say that, I mean, it's usually like 160 over 100. Yeah. And he's a college student. I mean, I know you are too, but I'm saying like he's a 19 year old college student. And like, yeah. you ain't 19. <laughs> I don't know. You might have. You look 19. How about you? You don't look 19. You look like a really nice 22 year old. How about that? I'm trying to make a compliment, but I'm not getting there. So, I even think something like whenever someone goes up in higher altitudes and they stay there for a long period of time, their red blood cells go up because of yeah, we have high low. Yeah, because the a lower volume of uh, oxygen in the air, um, and sometimes if they go down in elevation too quickly, they get sick. Is that, or if you go up, they get sick. Is that is that a result of the level of uh, red blood cells, or is that have more to do with nitrogen? I don't know. I'm going to have to go back and look because it's not going to be deep sea diving. It's the yeah. oxygen that can cause you to die. Right. But there's also hydro, hydrobaric pressures that. So I, I don't know. I'm going to have to look into that one. I know what you're talking about, but it's been a long time. All right. Let me jump into the white blood cells. These things protect against the infection. Now, it's, it's really pretty much an expectation of the, C, of the PPA to, to grab onto this one. Abnormally high number of white blood cells can indicate infection or cancer. I wouldn't even just, I wouldn't stop with leukemia, I'd just say cancer. So your white blood cells. So honest to goodness, the last time I had a physical, um, I asked for blood work and I'm a really bad patient because I said, I want this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And I mean, I was like, she's just over there writing down the stuff that I'm wanting. And though they call me back and they're, they're like giving me my stuff and I'm asking, what was this? What was this? What was this? What was this? And the very first thing I asked for those, what's my white blood cell count? Oh, it's normal. Okay. What part is normal? And I want to know because like those two things right there, infection, but moreover, cancer. Um, they are, uh, and then it also talks about the multiple types of white blood cells, and that's boxed in there in the next page. All right, so that's blood. Now this is cardiopulmonary. 
So let's start just talking a little bit about your loans and your heir. First of all, it says the thorax, and it talks about the sternum, the ribs, and the thoracic vertebrae. I'm not going to go there. I do want to hit really quickly, though, this thing called the muscles of inspiration. There is one muscle of inspiration that you should focus on the most. What is it? Diaphragm. The diaphragm, right? So this flat muscle. It is the muscle of inspiration. When it is weak, we must then use something called accessory muscle. And that means we're using muscle that's kind of global and it's outside, and we're trying to draw air in, right? So what we do is we use our scapular muscles, we use our thoracic muscles, we use our costoclavicular muscles, and all of that comes in right there, and you see that listed here. But first should be the diaphragm. So when it is weak or when it is sick, we use accessory muscles. The accessory muscles are all described in that second paragraph right there, but I'm thinking scalenes, I'm thinking levator, I'm thinking upper traps, I'm thinking internal and external intercostal muscles, I'm thinking pec majors, all of that stuff that you would need to raise those shoulders up to expand that chest open, right, to get that air in. Now, on the other side of that is something called expiration. Expiration is a passive event. Everybody do me a favor. Just sitting there, take a deep breath in, and then let it come out. Right? The air just falls out. You don't really have a muscle involvement. Unless your activity is so high or so laborious that you need to get it out faster. Or you have a chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder then you will need muscle to get it out. And that is looking directly at the bottom, and it says, during quiet breathing, exhalation is passive recoil, but during forceful breathing, the rectus abdominis, external oblique, internal oblique, and oh my, my, we know what this thing is, the transverse abdominis are all required for exhalation. But that's usually a pretty aggressive event. All right, so this picture right here, um, I really, before I go into the lower respiratory tract, which is the picture right there, I do want to address the upper respiratory tract, so your nose, your mouth, are both open for airway to come in and they attach kind of in the back of your throat and they go into the um, the larynx there uh, which is also coupled very closely with the esophagus and so your esophagus is the pathway down to digestion your larynx is the pathway into the trachea um, which is visible right there there is a thing called a glottis and an epiglottis. And that epiglottis basically shunts over the glottis. So food doesn't go down into the trachea or liquid that you, you consume. It doesn't go down that way. And it is bypassed into your esophagus, right? So you gotta kind of start there. And then as you travel down, you get into that lower respiratory tract. So basically the trachea comes down, it splits into the bronchi, right? So you can kind of see how that works. And then the bronchi, they, they, they go into the bronchioles. And those are the smaller levels um, at which uh, perforation, or perfusion, I'm sorry, takes place. And then we see on the left and the right, two different things. So let me come back up here. You've got a right lung that has three lobes. You have a left lung that just has two lobes. And then we go over here and we see a tricuspid and a bicuspid. And that is where 
the O.J. Simpson football jersey comes in. And I remember that to help me diversify three lobes, two lobes, tricuspid, bicuspid. And that's just what I use for that. Um, so, let me pause. Before I go into this next really nasty part, any questions to that to that measure so far? We did a lot of anatomy. Is what we done? I mean, that was a big anatomy review of the cardiopalm right there. What was the glottis, epiglottis stuff? I can't find it. Uh, it's not mentioned actually right there. Um, I honestly don't know that it's mentioned anywhere in the chapter in the anatomy side of things until you get to the Valsalva. Um, I don't I'll find it later. I was just curious about that. I would I would best be able to say that you have a glottis kind of open here and you have kind of a lid that goes over it, that's your epiglottis. And then behind that is your esophagus. So you've got the glottis sitting right here, the epiglottis sitting right here, your trachea here, your esophagus here, um, and then the larynx kind of comes down from the nose there. And then the esophagus goes down here to the stomach, and then the trachea goes here to the lungs. And I'm, that's not the scale. Is there any way to, I really wish Stephanie would take a picture of that because it really looks bad. But <laughs> is there any way to like, develop a weakness in your epiglottis? Because I, not us in time when I drink water, and it goes down on my trachea, and then I start. The wrong pipe. Yeah, the whole wrong pipe. That happens to me a lot. We've got a big lung. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, well, I, you know, you jest, but it could be that your glottis is oversized for your epiglottis or something. I mean, I, I, that's a great question. I don't know. It's not that I know of. I know there is uh, something called vocal cord disorder, um, which is a, it, it shows in signs of bronchospasm, which is the same thing as asthma. Bronchospasm and asthma, I, I'm not saying that vocal cord disorder and asthma are the same. That, I, I misspoke, I'm sorry. What I'm saying is bronchospasm is an asthma, but also a vocal cord disorder, that, and they both look very similar. Um, and then you just kind of keep it together as, as basal spasm or bronchospasm, sorry. Um, I don't know, that's a great question. I, I would definitely think that if, if it happens a lot, I would wonder if there is like a weakness around that glottis. And, yeah, and can that be therapy? I, I would think so. I don't know, you've got me wildly interested now. I'm gonna go <laughs> investigate that all night. I gotta figure it out if it's a real issue. I believe it, yeah. I know, okay, so let me take this one step further. There is a condition, um, a esophageal spasm, um, but it doesn't always act like that. I, I've never heard that before. It's more of like a, an odd chest pain um, that, and when I say chest pain, a lot of people think heart attack, angina. But until you've had GERD, you, you constantly think you're about to have a heart attack. I mean, it's like this settling discomfort right here. And I've had two episodes of GERD that go like for four to six weeks and, and it's just like, I think, well, I'm gonna die anyhow now. I mean, it really is what I thought. And I, I can't find the trigger. I've only had, like I said, two episodes of it, but. 
You know what I wonder about? You know, like the PNF stuff that we learned? Oh, I know about the PNF yeah. stuff. <laughs> I wonder if that will work on the diaphragm spasming, like when we're, when we're doing hiccups. No, I don't have hiccups a lot. I know, I do. Do you? Every now and then, like, probably like three times a week. Oh, <laughs> 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 Listen, I would, I would tell you, you have, if you struggle with hiccups a lot, I'd try it. Yeah, I'd try, I try. I was going to, and then I, I told my lady that we were going to try when she had hiccups, but then they stopped right after I told her. So. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lot of therapy for me, man. <laughs> All right, so do this. Um, I got five. I actually got six till. Take you a five. Come back, and we're going to start probably.